So we're very happy to have Xiao Bang Wu visiting us today. He is a postdoc at UCLA, working with Professor Tomato Brown, and has um, worked before at Carnegie Observatories with um, Galacticus, the semi analytical um, simulation suit code. And he did his PhD in Germany at the University of Göttingen, um, and Masters and uh, undergrad studies in China um, at Nankai University and Lanzhou University. And he's here to tell us more about uh, dark matter substrate formation and how he's using simulation suits to uh, study uh, the very different behavior that different dark matter models have in these patients. Okay, thanks for the introduction. So it's my great pleasure to be here today. Um, so so this is the first time being here in Hong So it's, uh, today I would like to uh, talk about some of uh, my recent uh, research. It's my favorite first on the probing the dark matter uh, properties through the small scale uh, substructure. So this is an outline of my talk. So first I will uh, give a brief introduction of, of the motivations our our work, so why we are interested in this small scale substructure, and uh, then I will talk about how we can model this the evolution of this type substructure and the start from model a single sub halo. Then I will talk about the status of sub halos, and, and then at the end I will give the conclusion. So So as we, I think we all know that uh, if we narrow the mass distribution of the luminous matter in the universe, so the total mass is much less than what, we, what is needed to explain different uh, observations. So for example, if we look at the spiral galaxies, so the, the rotation curve of spiral galaxy has been narrowed to uh, far away from the visible edge of the galaxies. And this uh, observation that we found this rotation curve will have a flattened tail at a very long radius. And so this is uh, inconsistent with what we expect if we assume that the mass of the, uh, the is composed of only the luminous matters and if we use the uh, Newtonian dynamics, dynamics dot at large radii, the uh, mass, the enclosed mass of the luminous matter some constant, so the rotational force will decrease at uh, 1 over r squared. So that means that the rotation curve will decrease as it, uh, but as the radius increase, the large radii, but it's not the case in the uh, observations. So that means that uh, there might be a large amount of mass uh, is missing from the observations, which is surrounding the observable galaxies. Uh, also, these similar issues have been observed in other systems like the uh, galaxy cluster, also the, from the gravitational landing observation or from the large scale structure formation of the CMD. So, all these observations suggest that uh, we may need to uh, rethink out of these problems um, the, and try to solve this uh, discrepancy between the Theory and the, the observations. So the normally we have two probes. So the first uh, possible probe is that we slightly modify the Newtonian dynamics. So for example,
Okay, should be good now. You think there's no sound? Um, can someone online confirm if they can hear us? <laughs> yes, we can hear now. Thank you. Okay. So go ahead. So, as I said, so the possible, the first possible solution to this uh, issue is that we certainly modify the neutrino dynamics on large scales. So, let's say if we come in this model theory, so the Newtonian dynamics is modified as this equation here. So, let's say this, it adds a new function mu here. So, the mu function will approach one when the acceler acceleration A is very large. So, that means that in the galaxy, galaxy center, so when the acceleration uh, of the object is very high, then this will recover the neural Newtonian dynamic, dynamics. But so when the acceleration is very small, so it's much smaller than this constant uh, a naught, then this mu function will be much smaller than one. That means that uh, it will uh, have a smaller or a, a very small factor around this here, here, here. So that means that if we to support a uh, select acceleration or to support the motion of the the materials at the outer skirt of the uh, of the galaxies, we need uh, less mass. So that basically solves the uh, uh, missing matter problems. And also there are also some other interesting theories to try to extend this uh, similar concept to the relativistic theory so that it can be used to look at the gravitational lensing effect. Then the second approach is that we just assume that there exists a large amount of non-luminous matter for the so-called dark matter. So this dark matter is surrounding the visible uh, galaxies and uh, their mass can be very large. So actually to reproduce the observations, we need the Dark matter density is uh, like more than five times larger than the uh, baryon, baryonic components we see. So, but the one problem is that uh, even if we have such high dark matter density, there's currently no direct detection of those dark matter particles. You know, this dark matter particle just uh, barely interact with the particle in the standard uh, uh, particle models. So it's very hard to detect. So then the, the question then would be, so how do we know the property of that matter? So, so let's think about it. So we thought we see that uh, we come here, I said uh, that matter composed a large fraction of matter universe. It will affect the large structure formation. So that means that if we, if we have some different model, it must have some imprint in the structure we observe in the universe. On the other hand, if we observe the structure uh, in the universe, we can maybe have some clue on the what that matter is a, and what property it has. So for example, in the standard cold dark matter models, so the matter particle just assumed is some very cold and the collisionist particles. Then in these models, we from simulation, I see that some simulations suggest that there's a lot, a lot of, there will be a lot of small halo forms. So this, that matter halo can form all the way down to the Earth scales. On the other hand, if we look at some other dark matter models, for example, the warm dark matter, which have a non, have a non legible thermal velocity. So then the small scale structures are just smooth out. So that means that we do not see those small, the smallest halos as we see in the cold matter models. So that means if we have some observations, when we observe the smallest halo, smallest cold matter halo that will rule out the uh, warm diagonal models. So basically, then the basic scale here, the free streaming scale, basically it determines on which scale the that matter halo formation is suppressed. 
So the friction streaming scale is determined, so it's defined as the average distance a uh, dark matter particle can travel from the Big Bang to the matter radiation equality. So then if we look at this equation integral here, it can be separated into two parts. The first part is that uh, we can integrate this from the big bang to the time that the dark matter particle become non-relativity. And before that time, so the velocity of the dark matter particle is close to the speed of light. And the second part is this part is that uh, the dark matter particle become non-relativity. So the velocity of the dark matter particle will be relative when the universe expansion. So we have another skill factor A uh, here. So if we're doing this integral, so we found that uh, the free, free streaming scale is uh, really determined by the, uh, this RH here. So the RH is the, basically the Hubble horizon uh, at the time that the dark matter particle become non-relativity. So that means that we have uh, more, so if the mass of the dark matter particle is more massive, so it will uh, become non relativistic uh, earlier in the universe. So it, uh, when at that time the, the Hubble horizon is smaller, so that means that the free stream scale will be smaller. On the other hand, if the dark particle is smaller, then we uh, expect a larger free, uh, free stream lens. So for example, for the cold matter case, this free streaming lens is extremely small, so it's uh, almost irrelevant for the galaxy formation stuff. But for warm dark matter, this free streaming scale can reach as large as the both galaxy scales. So that means that it will, it will have some effect on those scales. Basically, the free streaming, below the free streaming scales, the outer matter perturbation will smooth will just smooth out. So we see a large suppression of those uh, perturbations. So for example, on the right plot here, I show the leading matter power spectra for different models. For the pure cooldown matter case, which is uh, it's increased at the full number increase. But for the warm dark matter case, we see a uh, sharp suppression at a uh, uh, large scale or small scales. Usually, we can define a uh, half mode with numbers, which is defined as when the pulse linear matter pulse spectra of the model is uh, suppressed to the about one fourth of the cold and case. And from this width number, we can also define a mass scale, which is the half mode mass. So this half mode mass will be the mass scale that below this mass, the halos will not form. So basically that means that if we uh, look at the search for those time halos in the, our universe, we if we determine where this sub -halo, the formation of halos is suppressed, we can determine the half mode map and it can be then trans translated to the constraint on the dark matter particle mass. So that means that we actually can have some knowledge of the uh, property of dark matter. Um, other dark matter models, for example, the fuzzy dark matter case, so the pulse matter can also be suppressed, but it, maybe even in, but in another regime, so in a, due to another physics uh, called the quantum gene scales. So for this case, the it's not the free scale causes this pressure, it's the quantum um, pressure called this suppression, but we also can Define similarly uh, half mode mass scales that will uh, what will try to constrain from observations, and uh, the small scale structure uh, is a K the K uh, that we can use to distinguish between different dark matter models. So the question then is how we detect this dark matter halo. So the first way that if the dark matter halo is massive enough, so it can host the galaxy in its center, so then we can just uh, 
uh, observe the galaxy in the center of the tetrahedral and count the number of, set, uh, of the galaxies to estimate the abundance of the different halos. But for mass, for a smaller halo, for example, for mass, you know, mass smaller than 10 to the 8 solar mass, so this halo contains no detectable stars. So we cannot observe, observe those different halos directly or through the galaxy. So, but we can still try to detect those small dark matter halos through the, its gravitational interaction, for example, from, from the strong gravitational lensing effect. So here in this part, show a sketch of the strong gravitational lensing system. Uh, basically, the light from the distant galaxies, for example, will pass through the uh, massive ball from the galaxy. And the tra trajectory of this light will be bent by the gravitational potential of these foreground galaxies. And uh, then when it arrives to the observers, we will see multiple images of the same galaxies. Then we can basically defer from, we can observe the position of this image and the marrow is, for example, the is flux of this image. So this observation will contain information about uh, the mass distribution along this uh, light uh, path. So for example, from on the, in, the, in the middle here, I show uh, the diamond halos here. So for example, on the upper part, it shows the cold diamond case, which we have, as I said, it has a lot of small scale structures. But on the low half part, I show the one of the case which the small scale halo does not fall. So basically, we through this uh, gravitational lens observation, we can try to detect the, whether it's uh, like the Kodamite case or more like this one that case. So most of us actually uh, to detect the, the smallest the halos or uh, smallest halos is can use is. One of the best ways is to use the portable image lens quidas. So the reason is that for this portable image lens quidas, we have the full image, so we can narrow the position of those image, we can narrow the flux of each uh, each, uh, each image, and we can calculate the flux ratio between uh, the one image and the reference image. And this flux ratio can be actually can be very very accurately with some uncertainty between like 2% to 10%. And the second reason to do this is that we can focus on the narrow line regions. So this narrow line region is uh, extended enough so that uh, uh, we can neglect the macro lensing effect. But the, this region also large, uh, small enough so that is very sensitive to the small halos map in the range 10 to the, 10, 10 to the 7 to, to 10 to the 10 solar mass. So for example, using eight portable image lenses, human et al. in 2020s, uh, get a very strong constraint on the work matter model. Basically, they rule out uh, any form that matter models with particle mass smaller than 5.2 keV. Uh, as more that observation data become available, we can basically we will be able to get more strong, stronger constraint. For example, in this left panel here, I show the uh, basically the prediction on the constraint on the half mode mass or the particle mass of one that matter as a function of the number of lens system we observe. So currently we have like, uh, eight or ten or so. But if we in the future we have more, like we can we have thirty or forty uh, narrow lens system. And uh, we can probably put kind of, uh, a constraint on half moon mass with uh, probably 10 to the 7 solar mass. So that uh, will translate it to the uh, constraint on the warm dark matter particle mass of probably 7.7 keV. So uh, when we have more data, so one Another very important question is that uh, uh, 
when we can so the model so the when we the treatment so the, the approximation we use in, in the lens modeling whether it's, they are accurate enough so basically that means that we may need some more accurate model for the prediction of the better halos uh, in different uh, scenarios especially we need some uh, the very accurate treatment for the subhalo because for isolated halos it's relatively easy because it's not uh, affected it's not the significant affected by the uh, tidal form but for subhalos because the subhalo evolve in the host potential and it will get tidally uh, disrupt and uh, to model it it will need a very careful uh, treatment to get a very accurate result. So that goes to uh, my second uh, 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 second topic. So how we can model this pragmatic substructure. So here we will mainly use the similar similar model called Galactics, so which is originally written by Andrew Benson. So so this Similar models is very uh, so can be run very fast. So if you are interested, you can just download this code and uh, run it on your personal computer to try to just run like uh, uh, simulate you know, a Milky Way how it evolved and how its structure looks like. Uh, so so first, of all, like let us let me uh, start from the directly map simulation and see and uh, just do a and uh, talk about why we need the CMAT models. So, for example, for the, in the numeric direct simulations, this is then the dark matter density and the velocities is sampled by particles. So, each particle actually contain represents a large, large amount of dark matter particles. Then, we follow the Particle, uh, the, the output of the particle to see how the structure form and evolve. So, for example, in the left panel, it shows the uh, first cosmological simulation in 1988. So, in, at that time, because we don't have, we don't have that uh, very high uh, uh, computing result, so it can only run like uh, a few thousand particles. So for a Milky Way size halo, we barely see any substructure in this simulation. On the red panel here, I show the uh, one of the highest resolution simulations uh, done by uh, Springer et al. in 2008. So in this case, uh, they have run this with very high resolution using one billion particles. So in this case, we see a lot of small structures in this case. But uh, uh, this uh, simulation has helped us to understand a lot of interesting property of the dark matter substructure. But still, this has some challenges because to resolve the structure of, uh, of those uh, subhalo we are interested, for example, for a typical lens system, so with the host mass of 10 to the 13 solar mass, we started to, we would like to uh, resolve subhalos down to like 10 to the 7 solar mass. That means that we need to resolve structure of mass scale covers like six order of magnitude. So that's very difficult to uh, run these direct simulations. And also it, in one paper by Brendan Bosch et al. in 2018, they show that uh, even in these state of art simulations, well, still suffer from the artificial disruption. That means that those some of those subhalos will disrupt just due to numerical impact. It's not a physical disrupt. And third, that uh, even with very high resolution uh, simulation, we can only run a very few simulation for this. If we would like to look at uh, a large range of different technical models to our explore a different a large range of parameter space, we will not be able to run this uh, simulation directly. So that's why we need another uh, alternative approach called similar uh, model. In similar models, we we use some approximations to describe the evolution of this high halo and subhalos. 
So that is much faster than the Dirac simulation. So, yeah. To have these models, we can first look at a very simple case so that we have uh, just a single set payloads which evolve in the host potential. So here, on the left panel, this white circle, that circle shows the view radius of the host, and we put the sub payloads uh, on the elliptic uh, orbit. And on the red, pa red panel here, I show the sub payloads uh, so in the coordinate centered on the payload. And the red dash curve here shows the tidal radius of the payload. The tidal radius, which is basically the radius where the Self gravity of the sub payload is balanced by the tidal force from the host. So, as we can see, when the sub payload falls into the potential of the host, its mass is gradually lost, has to be stripped, and it uh, becomes less dense. And uh, one interesting we see that uh, when the the panel goes from the apple center to the period center. So its tidal radius it shrinks a lot. So basically at the period center, the tidal radius, tidal radius can become very small. So that means that the, the a lot of mass, a lot of fractal mass outside this tidal radius will be lost. So um, do you take into account the friction by the most? Uh, so in these simulations, it does because in this case I simulate a light pose, but I did not show the pose particles, but it's light pose. Yeah. So to model this process, we need basically to consider several uh, different effects. Uh, so first, we need to model the uh, orbital evolution of this parallel, and second, we need to uh, model the mass loss of the sub payload. And third, we need to know the density evolution of the sub payload. Basically, these three things may be uh, coupled uh, in a very complicated way because, for example, if you have a less dense sub payload, then the tidal radius will become smaller and the tidal stripping can become stronger. So basically, those effects are coupled to each other. So we need some very careful treatment for each case, each uh, uh, process. So first, we start from the orbit. So the, we evolve the sub payloads uh, uh, using this equation here. Basically, the, the first term on the right hand side is uh, uh, gravity, uh, gravitational force uh, from the host potential, and the second on the right hand side is the, the so called dynamical friction. So, the dynamic friction effect is that uh, when, we, when a sub massive sub payloads pass through the host particles, the host particles will be uh, bended by the gravitational fall or gravitational uh, potential of the, uh, of the sub halo and uh, accumulate behind the sub halo. Then it will drag, uh, produce a net drag force on the halo. Which will slow down the subhalos. That makes the subhalo will gradually sink to the center of the host. And here uh, we also consider another effect called self uh, friction effect. So the self friction effect is not uh, uh, well studied yet. So it basically uh, comes from the inter interactions between the subhalo and the stricter materials. So basically here in this plot here, I show the, so here the green dot here shows the particles are stripped away from the halo. So I, do, I did not show the bound particle with the halo. I only show the stripped material. We see that this stripped material is not bound to the halo, but uh, it stays close to the halo, basically roughly at the distance of the tidal radius. So we, so then we uh, basically have a model for this, which we assume that uh, the self-friction caused by this uh, strip material is proportional to the mass of those, uh, those, those strip, uh, mass and uh, uh, 
uh, inverse proportional to the distance of those material to the subhalo, basically the tidal radius square. And here we also add additional factor A here, so we should characterize the uh, asymmetry of these two strips of tail. Uh, and then the second thing is the, the mass loss. So we look at the, the evolution of the bump mass. So basically we compute the first compute the tidal radius, uh, basically which is due from this equation here. So the left panel, uh, left hand side of this equation here shows the uh, uh, self gravity from the, the halo. And the right hand side, the first term on the right hand side, so it shows the centrifugal force. And the second term on the right hand side shows the tidal force from the host. When this equation, uh, uh, so when this left hand side is balanced by the right hand side, so which is the give us the tidal radius, and the materials outside the tidal radius will be uh, lost. Uh, on some uh, time scales. Here we use the uh, uh, dynamic time scale of the hill to characterize these uh, mass loss time scales. And uh, so the there's a third effect because I said we need one to also want to uh, model the density evolution of these subhalos. So here we uh, the uh, use a model for the uh, called the impulse approximation. So basically, they mean that the, when the subhalos evolve in the host potential, the tidal shock will inject energy into the subhalo and lead to the expansion of these mass shells. So we can calculate this injected energy for each mass shell from this equation here. Basically, we integrate the tidal accelerations with time along the orbit to get the uh, the change the changes caused on the uh, the, the, the energy of the element particle in a uh, mass shell of the subhalo. And in practice we also consider a second order fraction to this because we found that if you only include this uh, first order term so as here. We can also get a very uh, accurate uh, description of the, the, the density profile. So we put this second term here. So the second term is just uh, uh, proportional to the square root of this first order term yeah. and also uh, depend on this chi here. The chi here is the uh, correlations between the uh, the uh, like matter velocity dispersion and the like matter position. And that two here is some constant uh, um, coefficient we need to calibrate uh, to simulations. So basically, after getting the opinion due to the first order term plus the second order term, we try to solve this uh, equation here because we assume that the mass shell is always in a period equilibrium. So we know we have a mass shell with intermediate Ri. So it gets some heating energy injected by the tidal shock. So it expands to reach a larger radius like RF. Then using the virial equilibrium, we get this project here. We see the um, we can solve the final radius of the mass shell given the, the heating energy injected by the tidal shock. And uh, we can use the mass conservations here to translate this uh, relation between the initial radius and the final radius to the density uh, of the subhalo at the annual radius after the tidal shock. So basically, then we have orbit, we have the mass law, we have density. So we can try to. Uh, compare our similar models with uh, uh, the numerical simulation we have done. So basically we can try to uh, run, do some calibrations. So, so here, because in, in the uh, 
case we consider here, we consider only like a uh, uh, subhalo with a mass of 10 to the 9th of the mass and a host mass of 10 to the 12th. So, so the mass ratio of the subhalo to the host is like 1 um, to 1,000. So in this case, uh, the dynamic friction and self-friction effect is very small. So we actually ignore that part to and try to only take the, the mass loss and also the density file. So here there is a log likelihood function we use. So the first term is the uh, from the fit for the mass, the bump mass of the halo, and uh, here the second uh, line here is the uh, uh, fit fit the maximum simple velocity. The maximum simple velocity basically that we the simple velocity we can can be compute as the gm over square root of gm over r. So the it's maximum scalar velocity is just the peak of this scalar velocity, and the, the R max is the radius which uh, where this maximum uh, reach. So basically, these two R max and V max will uh, determine the uh, the shape of the density profile. So basically, then we use the like log likelihood function uh, log likelihood function to uh, run some. Uh, FGMC uh, fitting and uh, try to uh, find the, the uh, fit this, uh, try to calibrate the, the, uh, the, the model parameter here. So we have uh, one model, one parameter for the tidal shooting and uh, three parameter for the tidal fitting to so model the density profiles. So then um, to, after the calibration, we uh, like to so basically this shows some our result from the calibr calibration. So here we instead of uh, apart from this n other profile, we also consider uh, a more general formula for the dark matter profile here because in different dark matter models sometimes we see a flat pool from in the center of halos, and in some cases. Uh, for example, for the self-interacting dark matter case, uh, the strong self-interactions uh, in the central region of the dark matter halo may lead to the core clap, so means which makes the dark matter profile uh, even hasty than the MW profile. So here, we, because we would like to build some general model that works for a lot of different dark matter models, we consider this general form of dark matter profile and look how this uh, each model can be uh, uh, modeled using uh, the, 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 the code way I mentioned before. So we come in the first part here, I show the uh, Vmax versus Rmax uh, divided by the initial values. And uh, the gamma here, uh, basically characterize the slope of the center density. For example, for the gamma equal zero case, it means that it has a flat core in the center. For gamma equal one, it's just a euro and dollar profile for cold diameter. For gamma equal one point five, it's a, a profile that are more costly than the euro and dollar profile. So for all this case, it will start from the uh, upper right corner here, so basically from one one here, and evolve. When you evolve, it will uh, gradually move to the uh, lower left uh, corner here. So we see that uh, actually, if we take different dimensional profiles, the evolution of this track is very different. So, for example, in the Casby case. So the uh, decrease of this is Mac is much slower than the oh, and then this blue curve, which is the core case. And then one interesting phenomenon uh, feature is that you can see that for this core case, we even see that this uh, have a turnover at some point. So this is uh, this R max and V max first uh, decrease and at some time then the R max. It uh, increase again. Basically, this is taught by that uh, if we assume that we have a flat core in the center, so then 
uh, as it is uh, tidally heated, the the basically the, the mass shell expand, so the the mass halo become less dense. So the uh, maximum spool velocity will decrease. But at a later time, when the R max is close to the core radius, then in that case, because the core radius, the, in the core region, so the density is just not constant. So that means that if we compute the, uh, so the enclosed mass will still as uh, R to the cubic. So then the, uh, the, the circle velocity will still at uh, R linearly R. So that means that this R max will be just uh, uh, about the, at the edge of the core. So that means that as this tidal heating continues, so the core will expand, the core side expands, so that leads to this increase in R max here. So we can see that for all these cases, so the, our models showed by the solid color curve can well fit to the early simulations. So that means that we, our model here is very robust. And also on the right upper panel here, so the bound mass fraction, which it shows the uh, bound mass as a function of time. You can also see that we can have a good uh, match to the simulation result. So just to give an example for the density profile, I compare this uh, case that with the uh, NFW profile to the case that if we have a cooled density profile. So one interesting thing we can see is that for the NFW profile, which is CAT, the central density of this the payload does not evolve much as the, it evolved in the host. But in the core case, we actually see that the central density dropped uh, significantly. So that means that uh, uh, we, if we have a core profile, and uh, uh, if we look at the uh, observation, we may be able to distinguish between this core case and the cuspid case. And uh, finally, the uh, uh, a result from this we see is that uh, for this. As I said, for this MW cosmic case, so the density in the center does not evolve much. So this means that uh, as this subhalo is tidally straight, so it's become smaller and smaller, but uh, we always have some cosmic core remain uh, in, the, in the center of the subhalo. But in the core case, we can actually get a physical disruption of some payloads. Uh, okay. Yeah, then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that so in the simulations, we always have numerical artifacts. So one uh, application of our similar model is that uh, we can try to model this uh, numerical artifact because this numerical artifact is caused by the finite resolution. Because the resolution can be determined, for example, for the envelope simulation, the resolution of simulation is determined by first the softened lens, which basically uh, uh, the softened the gravitational potential of the point particles. And uh, also, this re uh, resolution also is determined by the number of particles. So here we. Uh, basically give a very simple model for this artificial uh, effect. So basically we, for example, if we have a, uh, initially have an NF double file, for example, for the cold number the case, we artificially add a core to this profile. Then we evolve this core profile using our similar model. Then, as I mentioned here, for core profile, we have, we can actually have physical disruptions. So that means that if we have this artificial core in the center of the, of the profile, so this halo may get disrupted. So that mimics the artificial disruption 
in what we see in the numeric simulations. And on the red panel here, I saw one simple case that we uh, in this case we have a t equal to zero, we have a, a, a stable NFW profile. If we have finite, uh, in, infinite, in, infinite resolutions, the halo should uh, be stable. So it will, after it will evolve for some time, it will stay at the black curve. But actually, due to the finite resolution effect, we, after three giga year, we actually see that this uh, density profile is decreased in the center. It actually forms some kind of core in the center, which is uh, the case that, as the case that we, uh, uh, it's consistent with the case that we add an actual core to this of halos. And the core size is uh, determined by this uh, sorting lens and also the particle mass. So basically here the R here is the basically the radius enclosed basically 36 uh, particles. So then the this mass solution is determined by the uh, uh, smaller one of these two. Yeah. So then after we consider these single sum halos, then the question is that uh, how we uh, look at the status of a lot of subhalos, because in reality, a uh, whole halo contains a lot of subhalos. So this is our procedure to do this. So first, we build one color merger tree using the standard press structure formalism. Basically, we, from some root halo, we keep, draw, uh, keep finding its progeny halos, and until it, the progeny halos reach some mass resolution, basically we get this whole model history, then we will evolve the each of these halos in the model trees forward in time. We know if they, this, uh, these two halos merge at this time, so the small halos will become the subhalo of this bigger one. So we set that set the property of the subhalo at infall. So the for example the, the uh, velocity, the orbital velocity of the subhalo is to draw from distribution which is narrow from cosmology simulations. Then we neglect the interaction between subhalos. So basically we evolve each subhalos uh, individually in the host potential and neglect any uh, subhalo subhalo interactions. And then when these halos with a subhalo then merge with another halo here, we may have sub subhalo. And the subhalo, sub subhalo is, we keep track of the sub subhalo within the subhalos until the sub subhalo is outside the tidal radius of the subhalo. Basically, we can track a uh, 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 multiple level of subhalos in uh, this approach. And on the red panel plot here, I show one example of the, from the output of the simulated models here. We have a bunch of subhalos, and we can narrow the Special distribution of the subhalo, we can narrow the bump mass of the subhalo, we can narrow the density profile of the subhalos. And then we can, the question is that whether this prediction here is uh, consistent with real cosmic simulation. So here I compare our model prediction with uh, some cosmological zoom simulation from the symphony simulations. Uh, here the blue and orange solid curve shows our model prediction and the dash, the blue dash curve and this orange arrow bar shows what we measure from um, cosmological looming simulations. So this left panel shows the circular mass function. We see that uh, even if, even we do not, did, we haven't calibrated our model to this cosmological simulation. If we can it only to uh, the simulation of one single subhalo, we can actually reproduce very well the uh, cosmology simulation result for the subhalo mass function uh, for the colder matter and also for the warm matter models. 
And on, on the red panel, I show the auto prediction for the radio distribution of subhandles compared to the cosmology simulation. Again, we see good agreement between this our model and the numerical simulation. This is that suggests our subhandle models work very well. And uh, secondly, the uh, subhandle subhandle interaction we need we neglect is uh, uh, is we have a negligible uh, effect on this selected properties. And after getting this, we can also ask the question that if we have different dark matter density profile, how it will affect the subhalo balance function and the radio diffusion, sub, uh, diffusion of subhalos. So here I show some of the model prediction, or model prediction here. So here I change the density profile of the, of the dark matter subhalos from core one to very colorful ones. So as, as we expected for more cuspy, for more cuspy halos, the tidal straightening effect is uh, less significant. So we get higher subhalo functions. For example, for this red uh, solid curve and blue solid curve. And for the core case, for example, this blue solid curve, the subhalo function is pressed like by Roughly forty percent. Actually, that means that if we measure the type of function, we may be able to distinguish between the core case and the custom case. And uh, as a test, I also add this dash curve and dot curve here. Which case uh, for this dash curve, uh, for this dot curve here, I basically change the uh, whole because in the in the core case, the host profile and the subhalo profile are all core. So I, here I would like to see if we have a custody hold by the core subhalo, what will be it will look like. So it's shown by this uh, that, uh, the dotted curve here. So we said if we uh, switch to a custody hold, it will uh, produce even stronger tidal shading that is lower than make this subhalo even lower than the blue curve here. And if we change the host of the custody K from the custody profile to a core profile, we see that the penetrating is less efficient. So we see the supplement function higher than the, uh, the this green case. And on the red panel here, so the radio distribution of subtitles. Again, we see that uh, uh, if we go from the cuspy to cool case, we extract the more straight back. So we expect this uh, number of subhalos is lower in this cool case and cuspy K. But one interesting thing we can see here is that uh, if you look focus on this uh, small radii case, basically close to the center of the host, we actually see that for this cool case, for example, if we compare this blue curve and a screen curve. So we actually have more subhalo in the core case than the cuspid case. So this basically can be explained by that in the core case we have a core host potential. So that means that the, at the central region of the host, the potential well is less deep than the cuspid case. So that means that we will have expected the uh, less tidal effect in the cent central region of the, uh, of the host. That's why the, this we have more subhalos in the core case, we can place all this blue and all in the curve here. To further test this, uh, uh, we I also look at this at the, at the left panel I show, I look at this, if we change this uh, core host, to a custody hole, we see that actually in this case, then the, the subhalo in the center part is actually disrupted by the halo effect. So, yeah, basically that's uh, then the conclusion. Uh, yeah, so we built symmetric models for the tidal and loose subhalos, and the models are. Uh, Calibrate to high resolution idealized simulations. 
and uh, combine with modulus rate, we see that uh, our model can predict, uh, uh, generate prediction that agree very well with uh, whole dark matter, wall dark matter cosmotic simulations. And we see that the different dark matter profile actually affect the subtle abundance and the spatial distribution of the payloads. So our, this result will be uh, appear on our capsule, so stay tuned. So our next step is that, uh, uh, as I said, there will be more observation in the uh, near futures. For example, uh, in one project, uh, GWST project, you did by uh, Anna Nirvo. So we will mirror uh, 31 quasar lens system. So make it possible to detect like uh, that might payload down to 10 to 7 so that, so that we can use to put even stronger constraint on the better models. Then the question is that, uh, come to that, uh, uh, because in the current uh, 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 lensing model analysis, we have some uh, model approximation. Uh, we would like to check uh, if we replace those approximation by our accurate symmetric model predictions how it will affect the lens analysis, whether we can get some more robust constraint. And the third question is that we, can we actually distinguish different models if we have more data from them? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's evolved in the sense that um, I just show here we build the model trace. So the model trace, when the payload merge, for example, it form a bigger host. So the host mass will change, or the host concentration will also change. So in the last one, you were comparing this Caspi host and quad host. Yeah. That is just the, the initial. Uh, yeah, the initial. So in principle, even if you have a Caspi host at the beginning, it can evolve into a quad host. As uh, the host merge inside. So. Uh, I think now, because for the host, we do not have uh, the tidal effect. So it's, if it's uh, initial as a, like a core profile, then it will be always be core profile. The change, it, when it evolves, it only change the halo concentration, but it still have a core So actually, in this this model, we can also um, output the project mass profile so that we can use to do later analysis in the planning. Interaction between some payloads. Uh, 
I'm between sub halo and sub halo on the same level. So, but we still have interaction between the sub halo, sub -sub -halo and sub halo. But they need to be captured in the tidal area of the like, sub sub halo because it's a subtitle. Well, like, what's the definition for a subtitle? Yeah, so as that, the subtitle is mean that it's uh, within the title radius of the subtitle. Right, so doesn't that impact how interaction with it? So or it just, it just happens to be around it, it doesn't actually feel the... So you mean the, the so you mean the interaction between the subtitle and subtitle? Yeah, there's not, there's like no title written on that thing. It has, it has. It so the here I, I mean I neglect the interaction between subhalo and the I the interaction between the subhalo on the same level. So between subhalo and sub subhalo, not the subhalo and sub subhalo. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Between the orange circle there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then basically I think we can't mean interact between the moment it enters the space, the, the radii of the title screaming of the subhalo, that's where it becomes the sub subhalo versus the subhalo. So that's when the interaction activates basically. Um, now, um, basically, the subhalo is taken into the host by the uh, the, 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 the host subhalo. So basically, if we don't put this orange dot here, so it has some. So it, so it has a host and has some subhalo, and when they subhalo, but when this whole this halo merge with the even not a halo, then this halo will be sub halo and the stuff this sub halo and this sub halo will become sub halo. Gotcha. Yeah. I came with it. Yeah. And when the sub halo evolves, so outside the tidal region of the halo, it then becomes the sub halo of the of main host. Any other questions? There may be cookies upstairs. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how that procedure gets activated. <laughs> sometimes it's activated, sometimes it doesn't, but there may be cookies up there. Okay. So, thank you so much for your talk.